one of the interesting ways that some of these large scale frauds have happened is that someone who's like, say, the head of the lab, like gives the junior people a set of data and says, look, here's here's the data set. Let's analyze this and write a paper on it. And what never pops into their head is that their mentor, like in a way, their scientific hero, like the person they wanted to come and work with. Often you like you go to a university to work with a very specific individual to get your degree. Even nowadays, it just doesn't occur to them that that person might have made up the data the weekend before and given it to me to discover quote unquote, what the results are and so on when they already know. Like that's that's an example of what we'd call a commitment, right? Like you, you sort of have the assumption that the data came from a legitimate process. Like someone ran the experiment somewhere, you know, and there, and now I have the data and you don't, you know, you don't ask enough questions and asking your boss, did you fake this last week? Like, <laughs> Not going to go over well. You're right. There's there's always the social and the power and the other dynamics, you know, about asking questions, which is part of why it's hard. Even just the social dynamics of being like the one guy in, you know, the sales meeting who asks hard questions of the salespeople, like that can be hard in some, you know, in some cultures, some some cultures, some organizational cultures and so on. Being the jerk is not easy. And um, that's part of what sort of what sort of fuels this. And that's one reason why. We say in the book, like it's often good to try to get advice from an outsider who doesn't necessarily have the same assumptions in their head, who doesn't have the same history of familiarity and trust with the sources, who hasn't been paying attention to all the things you have, but maybe has you know been been looking at some different things. There are plenty of examples where massive frauds could have been avoided if the person who was defrauded listened to somebody else who thought it was a fraud before they got started into it. And we have a great example of a con artist who was about to con some, you know, some French businessman out of $3 million or something like that. And the businessman's friend happened to walk in like during the Skype call where this con was happening and said, when the friend went to the bathroom, he said like, I think this is a con, you know, like, and hadn't occurred to the guy yet, you know? And so, so that's why in science, we, you know, we do try to have a culture of independent replication, right? Like we make things public, we publish the papers, other scientists should be free to try to replicate the same stuff and they have a different view, right? Sometimes it's unpleasant when you publish something and then someone else says, I tried it again and I didn't get exactly the same results, but we're engaged in a collective endeavor, not individual glory seeking, you know, process in science. Although, you know, some people are in it partly for that reason or entirely for that reason, but that's not the social, that's not the social purpose of it, which we have to keep in mind. I think that our vanity and wanting to get ahead of everyone else plays into that, into that line as well, where it's like, oh, well, I've got the skinny, I'm moving up, I got this, I can't share this with anybody. And that's exactly what they want you to think, because then you start mentioning, of course, people are going to tell you that doesn't add up and that you're being scammed. And of course, you want to believe that you do, that you are the smart guy who figured out the shortcut, who who asked the right questions and, and got the, the right line. So some people have the reputation that, and many people had this reputation in the past, their experiments always work. And people started even coming up with sort of explanations for this. Like one prominent psychologist said that you have to have flair, flair, F-L-A-I-R, like some kind of ineffable you know, ability to make the experiment work that can't sort of be written down. There's no recipe for it. You know, it can't be, it's, 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 it's almost like, you know, magic or something like that. I don't think he intended it to mean magic, but it's it's a quality that's so, you know, hard to bottle that you either have it or you don't. And that is not the way science works. Like science doesn't work if, where if like I assemble the rocket, it makes it to the moon. But if the next guy, you know, with the same training and so on, assembles the rocket by the same, you know, instruction manual, it crashes. Like that's not the way it's, that's not the way it's supposed to work. And yes, I mean, incentives, of course, you know, can cause greater effort and greater work, you know, and greater achievement, but they can also cause greater fraud. Right. Because if there are two ways of getting, you know, the award, the legitimate way and the illegitimate way, you're probably going to cause more of of each way to happen. You know, once you put the award out there and you might almost argue that like the more rewards and honors and so on there are in a field, the more attempts there are going to be to to game them, you know, to game them in, in some way. 